Our next speaker for the day, ladies and gentlemen, is Dr. Michael Kippel. Dr. Michael is the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Learning and Teaching at the International College of Management, Sydney. He offers international recognition and academic thoughts leadership in areas of personalized learning, blended learning, learning oriented assignments, authentic learning, educational technology, leadership, and transformative learning using design based research. Let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Michael on board. Great, and, and thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, and what I want to look at today is uh, some of the challenges and opportunities of moving to online teaching, learning and assessment as a new norm. And we've all had to deal with this in moving to online learning, online teaching, and really uh, engaging our students in different environments as we go through. Uh, this has been a field of mine for many years uh, that I've looked at the particular spaces, whether they're online, the physical space is the formal, the informal. And I'll take you through a bit of a journey in terms of how I've approached this in a number of different institutions. So the first thing I wanted to do is it's, it's an educational ecosystem that we'll look at and everything is interacted and everything is connected. Um, and so when we actually um, upset one part of that ecosystem, then it, it may influence the other parts uh, that we need to look at. I'll talk about curriculum design um, and some the importance of it for future proofing what we do in our learning and teaching. I'll talk about the importance of assessment and if there's one area that is the most important in higher education, it is assessment. I'll look at teaching, I'll look at blended learning and teaching. I'll look at this di disrupted ecosystem that we're all actually be is becoming the norm at the moment. And then I'll talk about the online ecosystem as we're going through. So first thing I wanted to do in terms of this is to look at the curriculum design and um, curriculum and subject design or the program and subject design. When I've worked at uh, a number of different universities, I've worked at uh, seven universities, one college. Um, one of the universities I worked at over in Malaysia, uh, Taylor's University, we looked at program and subject design or course and subject design. It's a, one of the best ways to future-proof what we're doing in learning and teaching, particularly if we get it right in terms of how we approach it. First of all, we need everything to be constructively aligned. We need it to be learning-centered. We need to focus on the self-directed learning. We need to actually bring in technology into this space because it's very important in terms of the blended learning. And then we need to have assessment that is different to what we've had before. And this is assessment for learning. And what we focused on in this particular curric curriculum was future ready graduates. And my current institution, we look at career focused graduates. Um, and so it's, it's very different in terms of what we do, but you can future proof what we do in terms of the learning and teaching if we look at the curriculum design. One of the big things that we looked at and we felt it was very important and, and very important in this day and age is giving our students life skills. We wanted them to be able to have these graduate capabilities, the problem solving, the lifelong learning, wanted to, them to think as being entrepreneurs, um, global perspective and communication. And the emotional intelligence that's all left to last is probably the most important in terms of having it so that people have personal and social competencies as they're approaching uh, a very VUCA world, which is a volatile, uncertain um, and uh, ambiguous world that we look at that is very complex. Now, I spoke about the importance of assessment and I talk about authentic assessment and these are some of my heroes that uh, I'll quote here. We got Roundtree who said the spirit and style of student assessment defines the de facto curriculum. Also David Bowd who works in, in Deakin University in Melbourne. Uh, there's nothing that has a greater influence on what students learn than assessment. And then we've got Gibbs and Simpson. What influenced students the most was assessment. Now, the reason I'm putting this up is that if we get assessment right in our curriculum, our learning and teaching, and all the other aspects, it's the single biggest aspect that we can change learning. I'll come back to this when we talk about the disrupted ecosystem as we're going through. 
assessment. And this is the policy that I wrote for Taylor's University in Malaysia. These were based on David Bowd's 2020 uh, assessment policy or assessment principles. We've got to, if we start down at number one, we've got to engage the students in what they're doing is the big thing. Feedback is so important in terms of what we do. We need to have a partnership with students because unless we have a partnership, they won't learn about this assessment. And in your institution, uh, we need to actually bring the students into this particular culture of assessment. It needs to be part of all curriculum design and all professional development. And as usual, we need it to be trustworthy. And this, these are the principles that we use at uh, the university. And it's so important to actually get the students being partners and, and getting feedback as they go through in terms of that side. Another thing to look at in terms of this particular ecosystem, if we're future-proofing, is looking at the types of uh, pedagogies that we use, the learning and teaching pedagogies that are student-centered. Again, in, in this uh, one institution in Malaysia, I use these particular principles, but these are used by a lot of different people. The big difference that I did is that I made it that every staff mem member had to choose two or three of these in every subject that they taught. So they could choose guided learning and self-directed learning, problem-based learning, or they could do a different mixtures so that was going through. And so it was important to emphasize these and put it, if you like, as a threshold for our teachers. There's guided learning, there's the authentic learning and teaching, self-directed learning, which is very important these days. Problem-based learning is used in medicine, project-based learning in engineering and other areas, case-based in law, and studio-based in architecture. So we chose pedagogies that suited the particular disciplines we had at the institution as we were going through. If we look then at the next step, which is then the blended learning and teaching, and again, this set the stage for adapting to the online environment. I think in any institution, most of us are going online, but you have to use technology. And blended is one of the best forms to do that. The institutional blending, which is the formal spaces like the classrooms, informal spaces like a cafeteria, and virtual spaces. And then you've got blended teaching where teachers need to be aware of these particular affordances of spaces or action possibilities so that they can use the technology and the space effectively. Now for the students themselves, it's very important that they're active, they have interactive learning with resources, that they look at network learning with other students and that they create content and that the assessment is authentic because they're then solving real world problems. And that's what we want them to do. And that's why assessment is so important in this particular educational ecosystem that I talk about. This is the structure, if you like, going through. Um, again, this is the blended environment. Not as many of us are doing these, day these days. Um, Sydney, we're lucky at the institution I'm at that we had 25% of our students on campus in the first term. We have 50% in the second term and we're using a different form of blending to actually bring in our international students as well as our face-to-face -face students in the classroom. So the blending is a particular good way to go. Also too, we've got study centers around the, the globe that we actually use this principle for as well. But you can see the particular uh, framework that you're, you're looking at there, the types of interactions as you're going through. In the online learning and teaching spaces, synchronous and asynchronous spaces are important those at the same time like we're doing now and other ones that you can think about and reflect on and respond to like a discussion forum. These are some of the spaces that we need to aspire to and we need to bring into the online environment. Students working in groups, being able to project their screen uh, to each other, having student-led discussions and also having different collaborative nature and this this could be an example, if you like, of project-based learning or problem-based learning, depending on the discipline that you're looking at. But again, if you choreograph the space, whether it's physical or virtual, that allows you to do that as you're going through. If we change tact a little bit here now in terms of um, what we need, and I spoke about this earlier, about the idea of um, life skills or um, gradual capabilities. 
you can see here we're in 2021 at the moment so i need to update this but you can see the importance of emotional intelligence in 2020 uh, at number six that was not on the list in 2015. So it's quite interesting to see the types of things that are of value with this particular study. So I'll talk about this life skills because I think it's even more important during the pandemic and when we're teaching and, and post pandemic as well. Uh, so we'll look at the idea that we introduced two core modules. One was about personal competencies, so life skills for success and well-being, and students developing a toolkit for most of their essential life skills. So whether you did medicine or whether you did education, you still actually did these particular uh, core modules, and they were assessed like any other module as they're going through. So this is the VUCA world I was talking about, a volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world. And um, very much like what we're dealing with now around the globe in terms of working with our students and teaching in different environments as we go through. This uh, was my life skills uh, team in uh, Taylor's University in Malaysia. Uh, they were uh, life coaches, social workers, um, a, a variety of different people who had very good capabilities in these areas. They did work face to face, but they also were particularly good in the, in the online environment. And although they hesitated going to the online environment, they ended up having the highest score of any of our teachers uh, when they taught in the online environment. Some of the things that they would do, they would have an emotional uh, well-being wheel and they'd ask the students to pick one word of how they felt for the day at the start of the lesson. And then they would deal with that and continue on with the lesson. Again, very important when we're dealing with students at a distance in the online environment. So that's what I'll change tack to now because this is the important part that what we need to look at is this, uh, this idea that all of us have had to move to online teaching, learning and assessment in a hurry. I call this the disrupted ecosystem because the one you saw there is what we were trying to do along the way. <coughs> Excuse me. So for, for some of the things that we're looking at here now, these are some of the, if you like, the challenges in this environment. Online learning and teaching spaces that we spoke about, the digital literacies and the staff uh, literacies that we're looking at, this blurring of spaces for work and life, the online assessment, which is the, one of the biggest challenges that we can look at, <coughs> and looking at this idea of the ICT infrastructure, the different sorts of things that we're using like Zoom, uh, that we're doing now, the isolation and the disconnection or connection and the professional development. If we look at then, this is what some of our students were feeling, uh, hesitating because they're in a different environment, they're not used to that environment. Although they're social media savvy, they're not always comfortable in this environment to begin with. And we found that, and most of us have, have adapted and coped with that particular environment. This was the problem context that I was dealing with in when I uh, got 600 teaching staff online in, in Malaysia. They were teaching 11,000 students. I didn't know the staff capability for online teaching, didn't know the staff capability for online assessment. And also too, I needed to set up school assessment champions and use an evidence-based approach because we're all learning and teaching from a distance. So what I did is I did some surveys. I asked them, what assessment are you currently using? And you can see some of the, the figures there, assignments, essays, examinations, closed book, group work, et cetera. And so what I did is I was starting to interrogate the assessment that they were planning to use or currently using. I then went to the next ones about when they had to go to the online environment and they had to say, what are they planning to use? And they changed some of their different uh, ways that we're going to do it. And you can still see the likely suspects, the assignments and essays, there was still an emphasis on the closed book exams, online group work was high, quizzes were going to be high. So again, there was some change in what they were doing. And this then provided evidence for me to actually do some of the learning and teaching. I focused on assessment because I, I believe that if they could do assessment in the online environment, they could teach in the online environment. And I'll talk about how I went about that. 
This is what they um, did when they came back after four to six weeks, or almost halfway through the semester. They changed what they were doing, and you can see the de-emphasis on the closed book exams down at number 11 there. Open book exams became much more popular. Assignments essays were still very popular in terms of doing it. So there was a change in mindset, which is what you want in teaching in the online environment. It is not the same as we know in going through. So then what I did in, in, with that information, um, I set about having professional development webinars. Um, in that role there, I was Pro Vice Chancellor uh, Learning and Teaching. I decided to actually be the face of all these webinars and to, to MC all of them. There were 600 teaching staff, we had 4,500 teaching uh, staff interactions. We did work before the semester, during the semester, and towards the end of the semester to begin to help with going into the next part. It created a community of practice, which was the big thing, but it also got colleagues teaching each other in different areas. And this is where I relied on my assessment champions uh, to, to assist in this particular process. If you look like, um, they, they did blossom and they did do particularly well in it. And I see that is that there were some opportunities in this particular environment. What came out of it is that there's a more mature and diversified higher education ecosystem. There's a belief from the teachers that teaching is not limited to a physical space and learning is not limited to a physical space. Digital literacies uh, have, have matured. And then there's this idea of hybrid as we're looking at, and that assessment can be used in different spaces. The nice thing I have seen coming out of this environment is that um, closed book examinations are being de-emphasized. We're not cutting down the quality, we're just cutting down the way we assess. And sometimes they put a lot of stress on our students um, in this particular environment. Other opportunities, uh, better design, um, better infrastructure that we're looking at, and also, too, the idea that we're all talking about having an online campus now. The, the college that I'm working in at the moment is a small college in Sydney, but we're looking at creating an online um, campus space and, and putting niche programs or niche courses and subjects into that particular environment. Also, too, there could be this, this, this focus on decentralised staff that are located across the globe as we're going forward. Physical spaces have d diversified, and this is some work I did early on, uh, back in, in 2012 and 13, talking about the idea of physical blended and virtual spaces. Areas that motivate, uh, spaces where teachers and learners can use these particular spaces, and the ones that promote authentic learning as they're going through. This is the ecosystem that I go by. Um, and I think it's a, a particularly rich one. And it's almost like a checklist if you're getting into this particular environment. Any part of the ecosystem is going to affect other parts as in any system. You've got the curriculum design that needs to have different principles in online. You need different online learning approaches and teaching approaches. The assessment has to change in this particular environment. And it's a good lever to get people working and teaching in a different way and learning in a different way. You still can do group work if you have students even connected. It is a bit more challenging, but they can come together and present uh, as well after they've collected artifacts and put them together in a project. You've got the different types of online formal learning spaces and informal learning spaces. And we need these spaces that are both synchronous and asynchronous. We need to get the student voice into this particular environment as well. And you've seen some of the online professional development approaches uh, that I was talking about there. Probably for most of us, the existing technologies weren't sufficient. And I think the investment needs to be there to cope with this environment, including things like Wi-Fi. But most importantly, the organizational culture needs to change and it needs to be much more forward looking. I'll just leave you with where, where I am at the moment. Um, I'm in, in Sydney in the Northern Beaches. I work for the International College of, of, of Management in Sydney. Um, it's a, a small, small uh, management college, um, 
but we pride ourselves on our work integrated learning and getting students out into the workforce. Um, and it's a particularly good environment that sets the stage for our learning and teaching as we move forward. So I'll leave it there if you like, um, and thank you for listening and, um, and wish you the best in terms of the, the future for your endeavors in learning and teaching. And I'll look at some of the, uh, the questions in the, in the chat room as we're going through. So thank you for, for the questions. Um, the first one there is, what are the current challenges school systems are facing in terms of switching between technologies and upgrading? Um, so I, I think in some ways what you're talking about, the, the biggest challenge um, every institution faces, particularly if they're not as savvy with the use of technology, is the mindset. So that's one of the biggest challenges. Once you believe that you can teach effectively in in face-to-face -face and online environments and to use them for different reasons, then you, you, the mindset will drive what you can do in that environment. The other challenge that I've mentioned before is not necessarily about the technology, but it's about the assessment changing in that environment. In terms of switching between technologies and upgrading, um, in, in most uh, at least higher education institutions, you need to have a system like a learning management system, the, the big ones around the globe, uh, Moodle, uh, Canvas, uh, Blackboard. That forms a backbone for what you can do, but it's only a framework that you need to do rich um, interactions with. So again, you need something in that area and it, it depends on what you're looking at in terms of going through. You need something to communicate with the students using uh, synchronous mode, something like Zoom or, or Teams and, and, and that particular environment. You need to think of the technology ecosystem that you're going to need for learning and teaching. But probably what I've tried to show is that it's driven by the philosophy and the principles that you have in your curriculum, your learning and teaching. As soon as you bring in pedagogies like problem-based learning, it will change the types of technologies that you'll need to use in that environment. Uh, you'll be presenting cases to students, maybe in the discussion form, get them discussing them in a group, uh, if, even if it's written or in a Zoom session or breakout rooms. <clears throat> and that can be particularly good in terms of that side. So that the pedagogy will drive the technology in terms of that. And so it's a difficult one to know when to upgrade, but um, having the ability to connect with the students is is the important part. So next one down, uh, it says, according to, to myself, how effective is blended learning uh, across, um, um, I, I think what we're talking about here, the idea of blended learning, I think has been expanded. And I think most um, uh, groups um, and institutions are looking at this idea of having face-to-face -face students, if they can get by with it, and then looking at the idea how they can actually work, um, at least in Australia with their international students who may be still overseas or within the country. So what you're doing instead of blending just with the online and the physical space, you, you, you're blending with the different formal uh, physical learning space, the classroom, and also to the informal uh, learning space of the students in their own setting. So. So I think it's particularly interesting in, in terms of that side that new pedagogies have come out of um, needing to embrace our students. Um, by no means have we solved all these issues um, in, in my institution or in the institutions I've worked in. It's always challenging, but, but having a growth mindset and having a problem solving um, um, focus um, enables us to go forward in terms of what we're doing. So um, I'll probably leave it there unless there are other questions, but I, I'd like to thank, thank, thank you for the invitation uh, for the, the Digital Learning Summit. Um, thoroughly enjoyed um, presenting. Hopefully uh, there's some, some information that uh, has resonated with you uh, and, um, and do feel free to, to follow up with me. Uh, probably LinkedIn is probably the best environment if you're wanting to make contact. Um, and we can we can talk further and I wish you the best of luck in the higher education setting in 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 Qatar and and around the globe 
uh, and uh, I think um, uh, that there, there are different ways I think we can embrace and connect with our students in these environments. So thank you very much there. It was a pleasure having you on our platform. Thank you for coming and sharing insights. I'm sure everybody is delighted to have you on board and to listen to your session. Thank you so much once again.